when you have a brush with death, you just go like, nothing matters. Like, you think you're keeping secrets? You're not. I feel like that's the, thing, the biggest thing about being a secret teller on stage is people laugh in the audience and their laughter is basically saying, oh yeah, 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 I've had that. And there's something so comforting about that. And so, so often people are resistant to telling deep personal secrets that they feel about themselves. But actually like that's sort of the only part that's interesting. I'm John Heilman, and this week on Hell and High Water, I talk with the comedian, actor, producer, and director Mike Birbiglia, best known for his critically lauded solo shows, including Sleepwalk With Me, and Thank God For Jokes, and The New One, and also to Mike's rising star, pupil, mentee, Alex Edelman, has that super hot one-man show of his own playing here in New York City called Just For Us. It's also produced by Birbiglia. We discussed Edelman's decision to focus Just For Us on the exploration of his Jewish identity, which has long been central to his life, but not his comedy. Birbiglia's decision to take the young comic under his wing, the arc of Birbiglia's career, and the experiences that forged his unique combination of stand-up and storytelling, and why, even from the perspective of two comics who land killer jokes, there is a lot more to comedy than making people laugh. Mike Birbiglia and Alex Edelman also discussed the comedians, performers, and writers, including Mitch Hedberg, Tig Notaro, David Foster Wallace, interestingly, who have most significantly influenced their work and raised their standards. Hope you enjoy it. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about Alex's show and your guys' collaboration, which is really like the way that I'm really interested in that. I know, and this is what I raised with you originally, kind of how that collaborative mentor, mentee, older, younger thing worked. I want to talk about like your, both of your history and a little some of the influences, the people that will play a little stuff that have, you guys have, have been, people have been important in shaping what you do. So let's play clip number one of Alex Elman's Just For Us. Every day, I think about my own Jewish identity, and whether or not I'm too Jewish or not Jewish. And, like, sometimes I meet Christians. And they're, no, 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 no. Sometimes I meet Christians, and they're like, well, I used to be a Christian, but I'm not anymore. And I don't say anything, but it blows my mind. Because, like, that's not, you guys know, that's not how it works in Judaism. Judaism is the Hotel California of <laughs> <laughs> That's true. I felt like if we were going to start talking about your humor and your mm -hmm. show, we might want to play something that had to do with Jewish identity. Jewish identity, yeah. I mean, yeah, it's like, it's so tough because like, it's so invested in my personhood. Yeah. It's invested in every aspect of my life, my Judaism, but um, I don't want to just be like, I'm sure this is going to come out in a way that's less eloquent than I want, but like, I don't want to just be like the Jew for people. And it's frustrating because like, I see myself sort of in that way. Yeah. And also like, because of, you know, the way things work between performers and audiences, skilled performers and their audiences, audiences respond to what is resonant with a performer. So it's this weird tension between like, really wanting to lean into my Judaism, but not wanting to sort of like put myself in a box or limit myself as a Jew, but like, you know, when it comes down to it, like when it comes down to brass tacks, like I am very much a Jew. Well, sure. So, it's, mm -hmm. But it's interesting though, I would be able to look back, I went back and looked at your comedy prior to the show and Judaism was not like, I mean, I'm not saying it was, it was wholly absent. Sure. But it wasn't central. It wasn't no. the central thing. And this show really revolves around it. I want you to talk about what the show's about for people who haven't seen sure. it. But how did you get to that place where it was like, okay, I'm going to go all in on that? Judaism had always been an aspect of every show that I'd done. There had always been bits and pieces about my Judaism, my Jewish identity. And honestly, this show had that and and a little bit you know it was it had a little bit more than my previous two solo shows but mike saw it and he was like that's the good stuff he's like the stuff that's really re like he could tell he could see past like a really experienced craftsman like a really great comic is able to look at a piece and go well that's the part he cares about and so mike saw past all the bs and encouraged me to strip out all the bs and sort of beef up the parts that were a little more resonant and then the show became sort of what it is because of you know because of me responding to that remit so so it wasn't even a it took a while to get to, it's actually still taking it's still it's still taking a moment to be at peace with that decision to sort of lean into because people were like well you're leaning into your judaism and sometimes they see reviews of the show and they're actually reviewing who i am as a jew <laughs> Versus what they, like, especially a Jewish paper will be sure. like, well, well, he's this kind of Jew, so, but it'd be great if he was this kind of Jew. Very similar with when I did this show, The New One. Which right. My last show was called The New One. 
and people sometimes would criticize me as a dad. Yes. It's about being a dad, but it's like, you're criticizing me for the thing I'm criticizing myself for? Yeah. Like, what is happening? Well, yeah. that's, but, but just, so first just say this. Say what that, like, if you had to give the oh. 30 seconds, the, the 30 seconds of what the show would just about us. The 30 is. seconds, the, yes. it, the show revolves largely around this, um, around this moment at the end of 2017, uh, beginning of 2018, where I went down this wormhole of, uh, like, anti-Semites on Twitter, and the sort of main event of the show is I went to this uh, get-together of white nationalists in uh, Queens, and eventually, one of the, like about an hour and a half in, one of them was like, sorry, but this guy's a Jew. And I'm like, yeah, I'm a Jew. And that's like, that's, <laughs> a, you know, that's what it shows. <laughs> sorry, sorry, that's, like, that's one of the best log lines for a show I've ever heard. <laughs> spoiler, spoiler, spoiler alert. Yeah. And so it's a show about anti-Semitism mm -hmm. and a show about Judaism. I mean, obviously, they're two sides of the same coin, but it, it's both of those things. It's, it's also required, like, a little bit of um, topicality. Because the show has, you know, I've been doing the show in various forms. I've been working on it since 2018. But yeah. the show is ultimately about this gray space that Jews find themselves in between uh, the very American binary of white and non-white. And so how whiteness for Jews is conditional, whiteness for Jews takes, you know, is, is sort of in the eye of the beholder. And so by putting myself in this very extreme, you know, in this extreme setting, removing my Jewish identity from his natural habitat almost as far as it could possibly be removed. Like there is a conversation about Jews and whiteness that I think is part of the reason that people are responding to it right now in this moment. Right. So you told me the story, you know, so you started working on it in 2018, this thing mm -hmm. happened. Mm -hmm. You started working on it in 2018. There's a, a story of you going around performing it in various forms. It's 2018, I believe it's 2022 now, and the show really, mm -hmm. people literally learned about it at the end of 2021. So when did you first see it? Because he did it in Edinburgh, he did it in some other foreign country. Like, he was out like kind of working on this thing for a, a so, couple of years before. Alex and I knew each other uh, through like social media, I think, I want to say. Through, um, I had seen a bunch of Mike's um, stand up and movies over the years. I'd gone to a couple of screenings. And, uh, and I got invited to the new one by your social media team. And then I went to go see the new one again in Los Angeles. And afterwards, Mike's like, I hear you have the solo show. That's pretty good. I said, oh yeah, it's, a, it's an old show. And Mike laughed and he was like, no, it's the one you should be doing. Yeah. Now, in, in fairness, he explained what it was. So now what you know, what's it about? And he said, he said the log line he just said right now. And I go, no, 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 that's your next show. Yeah. I go, that's not your old show. No one's heard of your old show. Yeah, that's right. I, oh, I think yeah. you, you got the next show is the one that people are going to hear about. And it's this. I actually believe in the sort of Steven Spielberg concept, which is great movies, great anything. Pitch it in 25 words. Yeah. And if you can't, you probably don't have a movie. And, and I really believe in that. Yeah. And 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 uh, and I think that that pit, his pitch, I was like, yeah, I get it. If I knew yeah. I was pitching, it would have been a four minute pitch, yes. and it would have sucked. So <laughs> I just was trying to explain to a guy that I admire that I had this that I had this show that I had been but doing. It doesn't, doesn't matter. But you're I, able, you were you're still able to do it in thirty seconds, which means that it's that, that, that something there. But I pitch it all the time as a producer. I'm you know they call it I think elevator pitch. The elevator doors are closing. You sure, have to sure. Go, da, 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 da. And it's it always gets people to go. Yeah. Literally, it just always gets people to go. So when he said it to me, I'm like, oh, okay, I have to see that. He goes, I'll send you a tape. I go, I'm not going to watch a tape of a theater performance. I just right. can't do that. It's like, I want to see it. How about I put it up for a night in New York and we see what happens? I'll produce it for a night. Yeah. And I thought, if this, <laughs> like I said before, Passover was coming up. Do you know the word Dayenu? Is this ju yeah, the Jewish phrase? Yeah. It would have been enough. So, like, I thought to myself, like, if just my Birbiglia puts it up for one night at the Lortel, where I've seen like amazing shows, Diana, like it would be enough. Yes. But then he put it up for a night in January. The Lucille Lortel Theater, and right before everything shut down. In 20. And then I, um, then Mike saw the show, and by the way, it was like one of the best shows I'd, I'd had because I invited everyone I'd ever run into in New York City, and. Um, it was, a it, was, so it was a very friendly crowd, and it went really well. And Mike was like, the show's sort of like a B, B plus. And I was like, in the back of my mind, it was like, that's the best I've ever done. <laughs> I was producing Jacqueline Novak's show, Get On Your Knees, at the Lucille Hotel Theater at, in that time, which was a wildly successful yeah. show. It was really brilliant. It's a show she did that's going to be a special. And, um, and so my sense when I saw his show was that it was sort of where Jacqueline's show was like a year before it was off Broadway. Let me ask you a question that a normal person would ask. Sure. Why do you give a fuck? Like, why? What is yeah. it about? What is it about this particular creative community? <laughs> Don't where, ask him this, Chuck, because I'm, I'm afraid he's gonna be like, you know what? You're right. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. what I mean is because you looked at it and said, 
I want to be part of this because it could be great and I want to make something great in the world. I want to do this because I want to help this young guy get to be better, like a sense of collegiality, a sense of like, what's the, what's the impulse that drives an older and more successful comedian to work in this way with a younger one? So my sense with both Jacqueline Novak's show, Get On Your Knees, and Alex Edelman's show, just for us, was here are these two really smart young comics doing uh, innovative things. They're telling stories. They're, uh, there's no tropes in what they're doing. It's very creative. They're revealing themselves. And my sense as a comic is like, yeah, let's try to get that out there. In an artistic sense, I'm driven by like, I want things to exist that I like. And so if they don't exist and they could, and it would take a little work for me to help that, I will try to do that. In a business sense, there's a principle of like, yeah, I mean, I could also, we could all make money on the show. Like, I mean, just in a business sense, like you're doing something, you're doing something, like Jacqueline's doing something. I'm, I'm actually working with another comic right now, I won't mention, but like on another show, but it's like, like if there's no business potential for something, I can't literally just throw money at something and go like, and, and go like, all right, so we're all gonna fail and uh, we'll all walk away. I thought like, yeah, that's a shot. Yeah. So Let's give it a shot. My dad is this, uh, my dad's a professor at MIT. Yeah. And he says sometimes that there are three kinds of uh, teachers. He goes, there's a teacher, there's an advocate, and then there's a mentor. And a teacher's commitment is to the discipline first. And like the students that come through his class, he teaches them well, but like his commitment is first and foremost to the discipline. And the advocate will take some interest in the students and advocate for the students, but they won't stick their neck out for them. And then a mentor yeah. is someone who is committed to, like on a micro level, making sure that the students, you know, work in the correct way that elevates a discipline. And when they advocate for them, they feel comfortable. Mike is all three of those things. Yeah. Mike is committed to the discipline of solo shows. Yeah. Um, I don't, I've never said this to you before. Uh, but Mike is committed to the discipline of, of, of solo shows <laughs> because I'm he's- I'm listen to this. Actually the only, <laughs> The, one of the only Americans actually doing solo shows at the moment in the right. way that is, you know, that is, that is classically in this gray space between tradition and uh, between stand up and theater. Yep. And he's an advocate. He's advocated for me. He's definitely advocated for, for Jacqueline. That show is, you know, wildly successful. And he is a mentor in the sense that like Mike's literally invested his, his money that he could be spending on his child, on his child, <laughs> <laughs> on a, on a, on a separate child. I think that like of all those three things, like Mike is selling himself like a tiny bit short in the sense that like he loves other comedians. He and he loves comedians who love. We always right. talk about I the mean, Star my, Brothers. How he, much we love comedians who love other comedians. Yeah, and also yeah, my whole podcast working it out is about like working out bits in real time with comedians. I love talking to comedians about bits. Yeah. yeah. And Alex is like super game. Like if you listen to my it's episode really of working it out with with Alex, like just like snap, 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 snap. Like it's just like just like you know, yes and, yes and, yes and, yes and. Like I love, that's my favorite part of comedy. And also I love, my, th my thing that I love about, about like solo shows is that Mike sometimes says that solo shows are poetry more than prose. I think where I was artistically, if I can be like pretentious for a second, like Please. where I was artistically in 2018, 2019, was like, I think I knew what good solo shows were. Like I'd seen great solo shows, but I was like struggling to put, I could build a core, but I was struggling to put sort of elegance around it. I tried to like discuss white privilege by like talking about like the one time I like met Prince William. Like it was, it was, it was, it did very well on stage, but it, it got the biggest laughs in the show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It got the biggest laughs in the show. And Mike saw the show and went, that bit doesn't belong there. I was like, Mike, it kills. And he's like, it's not, it doesn't belong in the show. And he was right. I'll just say this just as a matter, like as a narrative matter, right? This work takes place. You broke the show into pieces. You put it back together. Eventually, you guys just got it. The COVID allowed you guys to get the show yeah. up at uh, the Cherry Lane last fall. And then Omicron comes and shuts yes. it down again. Oh, and you guys must ride. have been sort of like, I mean, I got some nice notices when it first opened yes. in the fall of last year. But, you know, we, we've still ten of Then it, it got, got shut down. It got great reviews. The, t the Times was just about to come out. Right, then of course, obviously it took off like a rocket after that. But I want to come back to this. That's where we are now. You've, you've, finished, the, you've finished the second run of it? No, the second run, I'm in the middle You're of the, the second run, time. but that run sold out, so we put another six weeks on sale. Right. And those shows are, are yeah, starting to sell the out. At the Barrow Street At the Barrow Street Theater. Yes. Which is where or I did Greenwich, my girlfriend's Greenwich boyfriend. House. It's yeah, Greenwich, Greenwich House, House now. Right. Which where I did uh, my girlfriend's boyfriend in 2011. So for anybody who gets there, apparently there are very few tickets left for that run, which starts in 
Oh, that that run is uh, that run starts on June thirteenth, and like, yeah, those shows are those shows are starting to get to those shows are doing all right. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm told. And but like, I said I think there's a chance you're going to be doing the show for the rest of your life, but which um, is you know right now yeah. it's okay with me. Like yeah. I really like it. I, I, I should I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that you were saying though like why the fuck would you do this? And yeah. I think part of it is my entry into New York theater scene, uh, etc. Is was. Uh, through Nathan Lane presenting my show in 2008, my right. first show, Sleepwalk With Me. Yeah. And it came out of, um, I had been I had been a working comedian since 2000, and I had been working on this show called Sleepwalk With Me that chronicled uh, my sort of denial of my own sleepwalking disorder right. until I literally jumped through a second story window of a motel in Washington yeah. State. And, uh, and, and so, Nathan happened to be in the audience at Caroline's one night when I told that story. Yeah. And he sent me a nice note. We, we had dinner, we got along really well, and I told him uh, about the show, that Sleepwalk With Me, this show that I really wanna do, but you know, I don't know if I can and all this stuff. And he said that he would be open to presenting it. Right. And then he did that, it was fall 2008. And it, um, yeah. everything, everything in my career past that is a, a complete 180 from what preceded it. Right. Um, and I, I mean, since then, I've, I mean, I think I've done like five solo shows. I've direct, you know, written and directed two features. Like I, I, I basically was accepted into a group of artists that previous to that would, I would say sort of the snub their nose at what I was doing. Right. Um, and so and so there's that. And then there's also Ira Glass who mentored me. Right. Uh, with my piece on This American Life. So. It, a little bit, a, a little bit of it's paying it forward. The only reason I asked the question, honestly, is that like it feels like I mean, there's no doubt that your world, which I know a little bit about but not very much, is very competitive and there's like cutthroat. There's yeah. all that, stuff, but there's also seems to be like this kind of yeah, uh, most... a kind of camaraderie where this kind of thing is not. This is not unusual. It's not super common. It does not. It doesn't happen every day. Yeah. So like John Mulaney opened for me early yeah. in his career, and 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 that was like a bad. I'm trying to think of anyone took me under their wing. No, no, you know what's funny? No comedian ever took me under their wing. Yeah. Um, it ended up being Nathan Lane and Ira Glass who are in the field of theater and right. storytelling right. journalism. And it's just funny, I, I desperately wanted a mentor. Right. I, it's, it's funny, you're, 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 we're arriving at this because I've never said this in an interview. I, I desperately wanted a mentor, no one, no one wanted me. Right. I applied for the mentorships. It, I was turned down. These were informal applications. Yeah. But, they, but it was real. What's great about comedy, one of the things that's great about comedy is that it really is a fandom. Like you become a fan of, I'm sure it's the same in music or sports, but, but I don't know, I'm not, I'm not a musician or an athlete, but, but it, it really is like, I'm very excited to meet a lot of the people that I see every day. Yeah. You know, like, it's still, like I went to see Mike record one of his albums in, at the comedy studio in Boston when I was in high school. We are talking about this last night like 2007, 2008, whenever that would have been. Like, it is cool still for comedians to, you know, and also comics be giving and receiving notes is a very, is an essential part yeah. of, I, I guess, any sort of mentorship and comedy. I wanna play just to get to notes because I'm, I wanna talk about process a little later, so, but we can talk about it now a little bit. I wanna play another thing from Just For Us. Let's play this, this uh, the second, that, that number two sought. This is a, a thing, again, strangely related to Judaism. Um, uh, with Alex. The, there isn't just, the show is more than just. Yes, there's Judaism and anti-Semitism. Those are basically the two, yeah. that's what kind of all there that's is. That's what I got. But that's, that's, you know, that's what I remember from it. It was brilliant, but you know, that's good. That's a little, that pretty much covers the waterfront. Let's uh, play this, let's play this second one. I remember the first time I was aware of being Jewish. I reached your, I was at a children's birthday party in a old <laughs> Chuck E. Cheese. I was in a Chuck E. Cheese in Watertown, Massachusetts. And I reached for a slice of pizza that had some sausage on it. And my grandfather was there and he slapped my hand. <laughs> And I went, what? And he went, you can't have that, we're Jewish. And I said, what does that mean? He just went, it means you'll never be happy. <laughs> and I said, what? And he said, it means you'll always be sort of unhappy with the way things are, and you'll want things to change, and you'll always be like a little bit uncomfortable, but it's kind of a good thing. I said, I don't want to be Jewish. And he just smiled at me and went, buddy, that's the most Jewish thing that there is. <laughs> So there's like, it is like, I, I was making fun of you. It's, you know, the show's about these things, right? And one of the things about that I, that I loved watching the show the first time is like, you know, the way 
there's a I'm a freak for like narrative structure, right? So you're telling mm -hmm. this story. The story has a propulsion, but there's just all of the, it's like a. I, 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 I mean, I'm not saying it's like a Christmas tree. And there's yeah. like there are these there's ornaments all this, over it. You there you have digressions. Sure. Like where you go off to do an illustrative thing to tell a story, almost always from your history. In that case, the first time that I remember being aware of being Jewish, you tell stories about your brother. You tell stories about Christmas in your family and all that kind of sure. stuff. Sure. How do you figure out? Like what, and I know that Mike had some things to say about this. How do you figure out like what's, what's, a, what's too much and what's enough? Because it's very easy to lose the thread. I think that's a very, I think that's literally the question. And Mike has challenged me to like, like early on, Mike was, and when we started working together, Mike would challenge me to, to find that. Or, and he also like, like most, like most good note givers, they never insist that you take the note, but they, <laughs> they would hmm. like you to, they would like you to show your work. Hmm. And so. What, in deciding what to like keep keep my eye, like deciding what is the ball, like yeah. I say that the show the show is like to get into the nitty gritty here, I guess like the show is about this meeting nominally. That's yeah. a central story, but the show is really about what kind of Jew am I and what kind of what does it mean to be presenting that level of Jew publicly and not just publicly on stage, but yeah. publicly in my everyday life and you know my interpersonal relationships. Like, what does it mean to be? Um, Jewish. So like that's uh, like that is a good guiding point in terms of like what are the tangents what are the tangents in the show and and from a craft perspective um no tangents on a tangent. M like in terms of keeping the central propulsion keeping the like momentum of the central story going no tangents on a tangent. But like the show has to like you still need to be able to see the main story from where you are. You've done this for a long time, been yeah. very successfully, right? As you think about like, is that um, is that like a golden rule for you? Because you do the similar kind of thing. You you tell stories that you know you're you're telling a story that kind of lopes along, and then there's you know little digressions yeah. and eddies that you decide to explore for a little while. Like, is that one of the things you've learned over time? Is that like digressions are great if they're entertaining or revealing, yes. but you can't build digressions on top of digressions on top of digressions without losing the thread. That was a rule that my director, Seth Barish, and I came up with maybe three, four years ago with yeah. the last show, <clears throat> because we wanted to put words to a thing that we already sort of knew. Yeah. And I had seen a play he directed, a solo play by Martin Moran by the, called The Tricky Part. It was very intense subject matter about how this guy Martin was abused uh, by someone in ch his church in Colorado. Really beautiful uh, story, well told. Probably the best solo show I've ever seen. Yeah. Not a lot of jokes, but when I saw it, I was researching solo shows. I was seeing everything on and off Broadway and I just, saw, I just thought, that's the best solo show I've ever seen. I wanna work with whoever's doing that. Yeah. So I wrote a letter personal letter to Seth Barish, who I didn't know, uh, with a, my comedy CD. We had CDs at the time, mm -hmm. folks. What um, CD was this, by the way? Two Drink Mike? It was, no, it was Dog Years. It was a self-released comedy album before Two Drink Mike. I'm not even <laughs> self. That's a, that's a, a self-released CD ROM. That's yeah, like it was a, on CDBaby.com is where it was oh available. Oh my yeah, God. Yeah, God. Yeah, yeah. Incredible. And, uh, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a deep cut. Uh, by deep definition. cut. If you, I, you can find that thing on eBay. It's probably worth. I like, thought I was a perfectly a completist until know, just now. Crazy. <laughs> like, like, wait, there's a, there's some, there's some thing, there's a CD yeah. that he printed himself at his house on a CD ROM. Like, you like, know, like, the cakes they made like 25 and like, distributed crazy. to their friends. This is, this is <laughs> totally, <laughs> totally mental. We're all going to have to go and try Sorry. to find that. <laughs> yeah. um, so I send him the CD of dog years and then I send him the script for sleepwalk with me, which is so different from how it would end up. And we met and he basically said, you know, I, I, I like your style, I like what you're doing, but I feel like if I, would, I was going to work on this, yeah. we'd have to spend some, a, a long time, a few years maybe, working on it. <clears throat> we worked on it for a few years and we've, it's going to be The Old Man in the Pool, which I'm touring now to Steppenwolf and the Taper Forum right. in Los Angeles, is um, going to be our fifth show, The Old Man in the Pool. Yes. And so one of our rules along the way has become no tangents on a tangent because fundamentally I think the audience when they come in they want to hear the story and then you take them on a tangent and they're like this is fun yeah they take them a tangent on a tangent and they go where what is this about yeah what are we and then you go back to the core again and they're like oh it's the core okay this is the core okay or is that is the tangent on a tangent right. was that the it was the core of the MacGuffin of what the tangent, yeah. you know, is it actually the tangent of the tangent? You're sort of confusing your audience. And the thing that you ultimately want as a storyteller is actually 
propulsion, which you mentioned earlier, you want uh, causality. You want it to. You want to use as a screenwriter. You know, um, I always. And this is not my original concept. You want to think in terms of so then. Yeah. For plot, as opposed to and then. Yeah. Because and then is lateral, and and lateral is boring. Yeah. But so then propels the story, and ultimately. Uh, it's dominoes. Yes, it's dominoes. It's yeah. dominoes. So. So you can go, so then this, so then this, so then this, uh, and then you step out for a second into a tangent, you come back in, this is so then, so then, so then, so then, and, and this and those tangents give color and they're fun and we have a good time, we have laughs. If you go tangent on tangent, you're like, you're in this space of, you're risking yeah. losing the audience. It's the art It's the art of the page turner, really. It's like when you're writing in, in I'm not a picture of fiction. It's yeah. Thing. Like if that's what you want, is you want a page turner. Some people don't. Some people, digressions are, there are people who sure. love certain kinds of literary forms that they like, like to go off on long tangents that take them off for a long. There's other people who are like, I want to keep you like on my story and I will go out just this far, but almost I'll only go off on that tangent in the space between when the domino is about to hit the next domino. I want to get you back in there before yeah. that next domino hits so you don't remember, forget what domino is about to okay. cause what so next. So for someone who's 10 steps down a road that he's gone several miles down, yeah. like before I met Mike, like it, it's tough because for a stand up comic, you're trained by audiences and other comedians sure. to be like, laughs, buddy, just go out there and get laughs. And there is a bit of like, that guy's great, he can't get laughs. Like you need to get laughs. Yeah. And so once you start getting to a level of comedy where you can get laughs and you're doing solo shows, and this takes years to realize on your own, you have to untrain yourself slightly to realize that there are things that are as important as the hmm. laughs. You yeah. can't sacri you can't, you need laughs every sure. few seconds. It's sure. important yeah. you're doing a show that has something, but like that, that hard edge between comedy and theater or that like soft edge between comedy and theater, like, you know, my, my director Adam Brace in London always talks about barnacles, which are, which are jokes that get laughs but they slow down the momentum of your ship as it moves through the show. Yeah. And so every couple of months, Adam and I sit down and we trim off jokes that are getting laughs, but they're just not worth the momentum that you're losing as you move through the show. So I'll play one more thing of Alex in the show and then we're gonna move on, but I, I, only because I wanna raise one more thing because of course I'm, I'm interested in politics. And I said before, this is about Judaism, which obviously has political components to it, but there's another element of the show that's about anti-Semitism. This isn't really specifically about that, but it touches on, I wanna play this third, uh, sure. this third element clip, and then we can just talk about the politics of this show, which are deeply sublimated. It's not a partisan show at all, but it's like, I think it's shot through with politics. So um, let's play this third clip and then we'll talk. I have a thing for this. If anyone ever asks you a question, there are four words that will save you every single time. Would you mind asking me if I saw the game last night? Did you see the game last night? Can you believe it? <laughs> it's brilliant. It works for everything. It is you will three favorite things. I know what you're talking about. I agree with you. And most importantly, you talk. <laughs> it works for you. Someone's like, recycle it. You're like, can you believe it? They're like, I should bring it up on Tuesday. I like baseball. And you're like, can you they're like, they're contracting all the teams. Someone's like, the Kennedy assassination. You're like, okay, Kennedy. It works for everything. I use it on Israel and Palestine once a week. So I'm like, Israel, and you're like, can you believe I've got to go? I've got to go. <laughs> So that's like a, the yeah, only reason that's, that's political. The, the only reason it's political is obviously it gets to like, it makes me laugh because of that. I bet you actually you can. You know, my boss you know, Chris Harris is the one who taught my uh, my old boss on a multicam. He would say it in the writers room all the time, and I was always like, he doesn't know what we're talking about. He would just say it so that we go. But, but it's a, it's obviously a good trick in life. It's like actually yeah. a, a, a words, a, you're like oh that actually will work. But it also the end of it where you talk about how it gets you out of having conversations about Israel and Palestine. Classic kind of example. And the reason I'm raising it is because the show is, again, I'll, I'll assert what I believe. Sure. Please. Which is that the show is like, if you're a politically conscious person, attuned person, because not just because it has a bunch of anti-Semites and white nationalists in a room, but it, there's all kinds of politics in it, but you never talk about it. And it's like, you're trying to make, you're trying to be, do a very political show in which you don't scare anybody off by seeming like you're being very political. At least that's the way I read it. And I could talk about the politics of it all day and I don't want to here, but it seems like there's an, you're making a very conscious effort to be like, no, this isn't a political show. You're not this supposed to notice that. But yeah, yeah, I mean, yes. <clears throat> the answer is yes. Rabbi Angela Buckdahl, who's a rabbi at Central Synagogue, came to the show and she said, do you want to know what I think the show is about? 
And I said, please. And she said, I think the show's about empathy. And so if there is one political thing that's shot through the show, it's about where I think empathy and listening and conversation is required and where the limit to that is. And so like the show is very political, but it doesn't, it avoids touching on in some cases specific issues, even though I give glimpses at them all the time. And I do, I do jokes from both perspectives. I do jokes about Jews experiencing white privilege and I do jokes yeah. about Jews not experiencing. Yeah. So like, but like, yeah, the show is, the show doesn't, tries not to scare anyone off for, you know, for uh, crowd pleasing reasons early on, but it's also like, you know, there's very heavily political. And do you think about, I mean, you're a politically interested guy. We've had conversations about mm -hmm. politics. You're like alive to the world of politics. You don't do really political stuff in your work. No. Is, is that a note that, I mean, in the environment, this is not like a, a sociology of comedy kind of question, right? Is it like, you know, would you, are your, is it a note for you to be like, a, avoid overt politics and comedy? Or is that, is that, a, is that like wildly oversimplify things? Political comedy, I mean, John Stewart pointed this out and he, probably the best at it in the last 20 years, at least, is um, it's disposable. And so Jon Stewart sometimes will say, everything I did on The Daily Show, you know, what, what, what do we do with it? You know, and, and, and it's so powerful, because think of how talented Jon is, how smart he, he is. And what I'm trying to do with my shows and what I encourage Alex and Jacqueline and others to do with their shows, and this, I guess, goes for all comedies. Like, Try to make something that's human. Because if you make something that's human, people watch it 10 years from now, 20 years from now, the way that we watch Pr Richard Pryor specials now. I still watch Richard Pryor specials. And be because ultimately, the best case scenario from Alex's show would be people have a fun time, they laugh, they have a good time, they maybe feel something, and then um, they know a Jewish person. <laughs> Sure. <laughs> and I mean, he, he, not in person, yeah. but on their television screen or in the theater, right? You, so like you, you look at like, like, like gay rights in our country. It's like you could make a case. I don't know if this is true. They're like Will and Grace has as, as much to do with people being open to homosexuality as, as anything political in the last 40 years. Will and Grace. I mean, it's like- Ellen as well. Yeah, Ellen. Yeah. I mean, there's like countless examples of this in culture where we need to see the thing and see ourselves in the thing that isn't us per se and go, oh yeah, that's like me. Yeah. And, and then we go, oh yeah. And then, and then, you know, 10 years later, like more people started to know people in their lives who were gay, et cetera, and then gay marriage, et cetera. But it's like the pro progress is partly through culture. Yeah. You know, the thing that Mike said, I think, I mean, he's, I think he's making a joke, but also pro probably not the thing about knowing a Jew. People ask me now all the time, like, it's a very weird question to get as a comedian. People are like, how do we solve anti-Semitism? And, like, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, well, well, this is the problem. Let me take out my anti-Semitism yeah, notebook. I mean, let me just, let me read. But Jonathan Sachs was the chief rabbi of the UK yeah. for a long time. <laughs> I'm not a quote, just, I just quote rabbis endlessly. Uh, I was gonna say, it's like like you're, you're, you're beating not to be a Jew, you're being to be the Jew. The Jew, yeah. yeah. This, is but, the, this is the clickbait. Enough with the fucking rabbi shit. Yeah, just, <laughs> like, just edit that. <laughs> just like, I heard enough about the God. rabbis. Oh, this guy and his rabbis. Uh, Jonathan Sachs said the way to, one of the ways to solve anti-Semitism was to let people understand the experience of what it's like to be Jewish. Yeah. And I actually, the funny thing is I said that to a really thoughtful family member of mine and he was like, I disagree. And I was like, okay, so like maybe I'm wrong, but like, I think that works as well as any. And it's so interesting because there was a lot, Jason Zinneman, who's a comedy critic for the Times, wrote an article about Jews and, and comedy and yeah. how Jews feel about, you know, comedy about them at the moment. And he quoted a Jackie, he, he mentioned my show and he quoted uh, a Jackie Mason line. He goes, audiences, non-Jewish audiences walk out and go, it's a hit. And Jewish audiences walk out and go, it's too Jewish. And mm -hmm. I think it's really funny because I am having that experience sometimes where people after shows who are <laughs> Jewish are like, do you think non-Jews will get this? And I'm like, I did it in front of non-Jews abroad for two years and they, you know, I don't know. I, I will say one thing and then I want to move on. I know some others have said this to you. I don't know that you'll ever write anything again that has as good an ending as this show. Because it's, it's so perfect. I'm not going to spoil it. I'm not going to spoil it. But, I have that with Sleepwalk with me. Same it, thing. It's, Ira, Ira Glass always says to me, you're never going to be able to follow that story of jumping through a window. Yes. It's it's just, it's the perfect, it's also just the perfect kicker, I will say. Yeah, yeah. And so like you made, but for this show, it's, it's there could be no better ending. And I will say it's also deeply political. Because, right, political. because built into it is a whole 
universe of views about the characters that you've just you are the described. ideal viewer for the show and it's a nightmare to talk to you <laughs> it really is it's, like, it's, it's, it's like it's an incredible thing it comes in, but it lands just as a very simple joke that makes everybody laugh and as soon as you think about it if you think about it for any period of time you're like oh i this there's a lot I, in that thanks man. i, I, I want to speak to, uh, as an uh, but i think seinfeld agrees with me about this if i remember correctly yes. yes oh interesting yes. Yes. yeah well he didn't say that fatalistic thing that you just said you're just no, like you'll never top it but he said yeah. it was really good but he said they said the kicker was really good but yeah. but i want to speak to the thing that you you guys were talking a lot about sort of the jewish elements of the show and it's yeah. about judaism and stuff. yeah for me it isn't right i'm just an audience member i'm just one audience member in the show for me right. it's just about humanity and being alive, and I'm connecting to the performer on stage. Right, and he said this, this thing before, but it's about empathy, and I think also that's obviously there's a, it's about, it can be about a bunch of things, right? Yeah. At different levels, it's about different things. It's topically about certain things, then it's another layer about this, and then yeah, I think your argument is that the, whoever it was who said that thing to you about the, the essence of well, it yeah, is about empathy. something else that's not about any of those topical. And, and like, there's a extraordinary comedian who's, who's touring with me, uh, quite a bit right now, named Atsuko Akatsuka, and she has a really interesting life story. When she was 10 years old, she was brought, her grandmother brought her to America on a quote-unquote vacation, um, uh, uh, and, and uh, they moved here. I mean, and, and, and she was an undocumented uh, immigrant for uh, a lot of years. And, and her, she talks about her story on stage, and yeah. my audience, she's been opening for me in D you know, DC and all these places, uh, Portland, Seattle, my audiences love her. Yeah. And my takeaway from it isn't, um, oh, that's this person with this extraordinary story, um, an extraordinary American story, Japanese American story. Their takeaway is that person's hilarious. But the undercurrent of it is they go away with the experience of having spent time with this person with this extraordinary story, which is yeah. why I like Alex's show so much. The, the other thing that, that Alex said was, there's like, there's this thing, and you commented on it earlier in the interview, where he said this thing about when you do these shows, where you're, uh, they're about you, your experiences, they're autobiographical. Um, there's a weird thing that happens, right, where you're taking a certain. You, you said you were talking before about how audience, like your audience, is judging you as a Jew, or audience is judging you as a, in some cases, judging you as a, as a parent, right? That's sure. like a thing that happens, and it's. I, I want to go into it because it's in some ways, I think the, you know. It's an interesting thing about the arc of your career from stand up to what you knew now. So I want to like, first I want to play, I think number the seventh shot that we had cut, uh, which I, as far as we can find. Oh I, my God. We, as oh far as my God, find, I know this. I as, know, far yeah. as, as far as now we this know, is funny. there's probably another, there, <laughs> there may be older video of you that exists, oh but this God. is the oldest video we, that we so can find. Old. Send this to me, I want it, I don't have this. 2004, we're beginning <laughs> uh, on Comedy Central, Central Presents. Presents. So let's uh, hear a little wow. bit. Wow. I went to a dance club the other day, which was timely because my self-esteem had been hovering around normal and I'd been meaning to knock it down to negative a thousand. <laughs> Everyone tries to get you to dance at these clubs, especially women. They're like, you gotta dance, you gotta dance. And then I dance and they're like, not like that. <laughs> I, I'm not aggressive at the clubs. My friends are aggressive for me. It's kind of embarrassing. They're like, he thinks you're cute. It's like, what am I gonna say? Like, no, I don't! <laughs> no, uh. So I'd say a number of things about that. First of all, the Matt Damon, this is sort of a Matt Damon haircut. There's like from some early phase Matt Damon. Well, first of all, for, yeah, yeah, first of all, I'm like 23, 24 years old. The, it actually proves my point. It's in my current show, The Old Man in the Pool, which is I've had this hairline since I was 15 years old. <laughs> Like, mm -hmm. when I was 15, my hair was like, it's stressful around here. We're going to have to lay off some strands. And, like, that, that, yeah, I have the same hairline. But, yeah, no, I had a sort of a Matt Damon-y look. And, uh, yeah, I have like seen that It's like a little Matt Damon, like Ocean's <laughs> Eleven kind of era look in that. <laughs> yeah, there. I haven't um, seen that year. Not quite as good looking, but, you know, still a little Danish. <laughs> but you've got that kind of, like, New England thing. Also, what's that voice in there? There's some intonations there that are, that are not the way you speak. I always I always oh. talk about this on my podcast. It's I, a weird draw. Early, in early yeah, early yeah. in my career, uh, and, we, and I think we all do this: is we yes. we emulate uh, the uh, comedians we admire. In my case, Mitch Hedberg and uh, uh, Stephen Wright and others. And I, I actually was really drawn to one-liner comedians. Yeah. Uh, uh, and heady comedians and. So I had this sort of like, it's almost, I, I don't know how to describe the persona, but it's definitely not me. 
And uh, <laughs> I, I've heard this said by like Seinfeld and others in interviews over the years is this idea of like, as a stand-up comedian, it takes you seven to 10 years, sometimes more to become yourself. You start off trying to be like your idols. And at a certain point, if you're lucky, you become yourself. Some people don't, by the way. Yeah. Some people, and I, I won't name names, some people are very famous for ripping off other people's affect. And it's, <laughs> yeah. as a comedian, as someone who knows both of the people. Could you name the name like, of some, could nah. you name some, no, could you name somebody's name who's dead? <laughs> I mean, an example of someone who is the, the person who is dead is Mich my friend Mitch Hedberg, who passed away, and there got imitated by so many people who are now currently alive and thriving. And and it's wild to see because you're just going, I used to tell Mitch, this is Haley, hey man, like this person's sort of doing you. Yeah, yeah. And he would go, like, it's not that similar. You know what I mean? Like he would sort of like blow And they're in the off. back taking notes, it's not that similar. Yeah, not, not, <laughs> not that, that similar. similar. <laughs> um, let's, let's actually, let's do that. Let's listen to, let's listen to, Head, to Hedberg now. Just because sure. he's one of the, one, we asked you guys to come up with like five people yeah. who have influenced you, you, you admire. Mitch is one of the people you mentioned. So I'll, let's play that. Cause I, some people I think know who he is and mm -hmm. some people don't. Uh, um, let's play a little Mitch here in Sod 8. You know, when it comes to racism, people say, I don't care if they're black, white, purple, or green. Oh, hold on now. Purple or green, you gotta draw the line somewhere. I like rice. Rice is great when you're hungry and you want 2,000 of something. One time a guy handed me a picture of me. He said, here's a picture of me when I was younger. Every picture is of you when you were younger. <laughs> oh, that's so good. Oh, man, it's the greatest. Watch more it's the greatest. I His writing's so fucking yes. good. Right. I can watch it all day. Yes. I, I, so I, I, I was lucky <laughs> enough to open for Mitch at the Dayton Jokers Comedy Club <laughs> around 2003. Yeah. I picked him up in my mom's station wagon at his hotel and his <laughs> hair was wet and he was with his wife, Lynn Shawcroft, who- Man. Uh, Who's on the podcast Who I had recently. on the pod working out recently, we talked all about. And, uh, and I got to meet my idol. And it's Judd Apatow said to me recently, uh, this, this thing he asked me, he goes, uh, he goes, w did you feel in your career, like you weren't ever feel like you weren't succeeding the way you wanted to. And I was like, no, no, I got to meet Mitch Hedberg. Yeah. Like, that's how big it is. Yeah. I don't know if you have that internalism, but like meeting Hunter. my idols, it's like, that's the ball game. Yeah. And they treat you like a person and you have a real conversation. I mean, what the, we're gonna get more than that? Yes, no, I mean, we're all fanboys. <clears throat> So here's my question for you, right? So, you know, you, you were in this period, you know, that we just played. You're, you're, as you said earlier in the interview, in this, in this earlier today, you said, you know, I was, I was, I was a working stand-up comic. You were, you were, you were a stand-up, yeah. right? And then it changed, right? So just talk about, I mean, I can tell the story of, of like, as a, I could point to the, to the works that, that, that signify that change. And you did, I think, earlier yeah. around, uh, around sleepwalking. But just talk about what, like, how it changed. Like what the, like you started doing what the inflection different, point was? yeah, a different thing, yeah, and to, an inflection point that said you're working in a totally different direction, but also seems to have changed the way you think about your work. Like what, what are you actually trying to do here, and what your aspirations are, and what are you reaching for? So, which was not just doing one-liner jokes anymore. Yeah. So when I was uh, when I was in college, I studied screenwriting and playwriting in Georgetown, and and I thought for sure that's going to be my life. I'm going to be a screenwriter, playwright. I studied under a professor named John Glavin, who's brilliant. I mean, he, in my class was Jonah Nolan. I mean, wow. like, the, and the, the amount of people, and, you know. Mulaney, is that the class that right Mulaney, about Mulaney, the John Mulaney later, class. later took his class. Like, they, it, was, it was a murderer's row of writers in this class that came out of John Glavin's class. And I thought, of course I'm gonna be a screenwriter. I'm very good at this. <laughs> yeah, I'm in college, you know, everyone in college thinks they're really good at the thing. And uh, then they realize they're not. And then I was like, you know, gone. this is the 2000s, like, and monster.com, you're like, ah, no one's looking for screenwriters. Can you believe it? <laughs> to, to, co to coin a phrase. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and so then I was, and I was working the door at the Washington DC Improv because I had won the funniest person on campus contest. And then they asked me if I'd be a door person and, and a bus, bus boy. So I was doing that. And I was getting to watch like all the great comedians, you know, Kathleen Madigan, George Lopez and Margaret Cho and all these people coming through and I'm Mitch Hedberg. And I'm, I'm like soaking it up. And so then I get to the end of college. I can't apply for a job screenwriting, doesn't exist. 
they go, well, what can I do? I mean, I can, I can do stand-up comedy. They pay me 50 bucks a spot. I can live on that. I can live on 300 bucks a week and figure out how to cobble that together. And so I just, you know, and this is what my movie Sleepwalk With Me ends up being about plot-wise, is like just driving my mom's station wagon around the country, basically taking any club that will accept me. And then years later, you know, eight years later, I circle back to playwriting and I create the solo play that is Sleepwalk With Me and it merges what I understand about drama and what I understand about stand-up comedy into this hybrid that has become a signature thing. And then as it turns out, they're, they were doing it in Europe already. But I didn't actually even know that. That was like, that's like what all Edinburgh Fringe shows are apparently. I've never even been to the Edinburgh Fringe, but that's like the whole. Yeah. So like when yeah. I go to London, like I'm going to London in June, like, like people come out and they're like, people come out in London a lot because they're like, yeah, this it's is an a, Edinburgh show. like yeah. our shows. Yeah. So that, that sort of, and, and then the other, the other puzzle piece along the way is I met Ira Glass and I met Seth Barish. And, um, and I met uh, Catherine Birds in the Moth, the Moth storytelling series. And the, all of those things were inflection yeah. points towards yeah. the storytelling thing where I was on stage and I was going, I could feel that there was a deeper connection between me and the audience when I was telling a story than when I was doing what, what you played just now. Yes. What I was doing just now is funny. And, uh, you know, I have some punch up for it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I was thinking too, I was like, yeah. Oh, I no, the, ba the, the back half of it, I'm like, ah, that's you just, that's sort of filler. But, um, <laughs> but, uh, but, but, uh, but yeah, I just, honestly, it was, a, it was a, a connection with the audience. And so when I see something like Alex's show or, or Jacqueline's show, what, what I'm hoping is that that type of comedy where there's a human connection with the audience, yeah. that it proliferates. Because, I mean, what am I gonna do in my career? I'm gonna do, I do my fifth special, I'm gonna do what, six, seven, 10? I want that to be the culture of comedy. I want, sure. I want comedy to be able to make you feel something, make you think, make you laugh at the same time. Here's, so here, I'm gonna play a little sleepwalk with me. Um, this is relatively long, but it's, uh, it's from the show, not from the movie, but the oh. uh, uh, version of the oh, wow. I just performing it. Um, this runs relatively long, but I, in order to tell the story, which is a oh, key okay. element, the thing we gotta yeah. watch all things about a minute, a little over a minute long, but I, I wanna get to what the kind of, there's a kind of, ex, you, you don't just, all the stuff you just said, obviously is true, yeah. but the stuff you talk about is stuff that's, you know, there's a level of exposure. There's a level of bravery involved in doing what you do. And I just want to talk about like Thanks. how you got to that point that you decided to be brave in that way. Let's watch this. I had this dream that I was in the Olympics for some kind of arbitrary event like dust bustering. <laughs> and they told me I got third place. And I stood up on the third place podium and I'm feeling good about myself. I'm new to the sport. Uh, <laughs> And they say, actually, you got second place. I move over to the second place podium and it starts wobbling. And it's wobbling and wobbling. And I wake up and I'm falling off the top of our five foot bookcase <laughs> in our living room. And I land on the floor hard on top of our TiVo. And it, I know. And it, and it breaks into pieces. It was like one of these stories you hear where people black out drinking, they wake up in Idaho, they don't know where they are. They're just like, oh no, Hardee's, you know, or whatever's there. But it, it was in my own living room. I was just like, ah, TiVo pieces. <laughs> my girlfriend woke me up in the morning and she says, Michael, what happened? <laughs> to the TiVo. <laughs> I got second place. Such a great And it's a long story. It's, it's, a, a, great... it's a long it's story. It's Letterman, that's... right? Yeah, Letterman, yeah. So that's like, but that's a, you know, that's sort of like, that, that's, the, that's where you're kind of beginning to open up about this thing you said earlier, like to start talking about this sleep disorder. Yeah. Was like, a, you know, it's, a, not only is it, is it, is it not, is it, personal and, 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 and revealing and, and taking you to a different kind of territory than, 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 one, than the, the kind of comedy that Stephen Wright or, 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 or Mitch did. But it's like very, it's, it's the, the beginning of a process where you start revealing a bunch of stuff about yourself that puts you at risk. Yeah. That makes you vulnerable, that exposes things about yourself that are not yeah. things that are the things that people normally like to talk about, even with a lot of their close friends, let alone on stage in front of audiences night after night after night. So just, I'm curious about how you like 
got yourself to that place where that seemed like not only something you were willing to do, but something that is like the core of what you now do? It's a combination of things. And I don't know the answer. I mean, look, I don't know the answer to this. I can take my best stab at it. I think part of it is I grew up in Massachusetts uh, in a very, I would say, a very repressed uh, culture. Yeah. I mean, uh, I don't think I understood that until I got to college at age 18 because I had lived in it my whole life. I grew up in, in Massachusetts <clears throat> yeah. in a Orthodox Jewish home. Like, yeah, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so like I, I have a joke on two drink mic. I go, I was an altar boy as a kid and the answer is no, <laughs> I wasn't. I think it's because they knew I was a talker. I have that look about me. And, and I, I was, I was an altar boy and I, I, I fundamentally didn't understand that I didn't fit in until I got to college and I met like my improv friends and my comedy friends and I was like, oh, I didn't fit in. Yeah, like yeah. I didn't even know, <laughs> I had no idea. Yeah. And so, and so, and, and, and what, and the reason I didn't fit in is that I was a real talker, like I say in the joke, and I would say what was on my mind. and. I was surrounded by people who, in my opinion, I don't mean to cast a judgment, were just a little more withheld. And when I would say the thing, like I fell, you know, I fell off my thing sleepwalking or I did this, uh, or how I felt about something that was deep and uh, revealing, uh, it was so people would go, why are you talking about that? Yeah. Why are you talking about that? Um, <laughs> and <laughs> sure, no, I give it a little, a little no, kick. No, you're right. And <clears throat> so, so that's the one thing. That's, that's an ingredient. The second thing is, and I talk about it in Sleepwalk With Me, the album, and I talk about it in my old Man of the Pool show right now, is I had cancer, I had bladder cancer when I was 20. Yeah. And it was, and I really thought, you know, for uh, about a year or so, I thought, uh, this could be it. It wouldn't be a rap on Mike Birbiglia. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, we're gonna wrap Mike for Ten specials, really? That's a wrap. That's a wrap, people. We're gonna wrap Mike for a Birbiglia, you did a great job. Mike, you're done. Uh, we're gonna keep the, his brother Joe. Joe, you're gonna work for a couple more hours. Uh, no, the, uh, I really did think like it might be a wrap. And, uh, and when you face that at 20, it changes you. Because I think what happens is you go, and then of course I had this brush with death with sleepwalking. I jumped through a second story window at 25 or whatever. When you, when you have a brush with death, you just go like, nothing matters. Like, you think you're keeping secrets? You're not. I feel like that's the thing, the biggest thing about being a secret teller on stage is people laugh in the audience and their laughter is basically saying, oh yeah, 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 I've had that. Yeah. And, and there's something so comforting about that. And so, so often people are resistant to telling deep personal secrets that they feel about themselves, but actually like that's sort of the only part that's interesting. Also, it builds yeah. in, in yeah. interpersonal <clears throat> conversation. It builds. It's a double-edged sword because, like you say, the people who are like, "Why are you talking about that?" Be like, "That guy's weird." Yeah. But <laughs> yes. like, yeah. if you can make a career out of it, you will find your you will find your people. Like, I have, you know, or not a, even a career, not even career. I think in life. Maybe, yeah, that's I think, what I, I, I mean, like. If you surround yourself with a group of friends where you are open to not being repressed and telling your truth to those people, that that's a better existence. It's just like when I, I, mean, I there's the, you know, there's, you've written a couple pieces about like advice that you've offered about yeah, and, yeah. And, and that appeared in the Times. And there's, a, and there's a place where you, there, one of those pieces, I forget which one it was, but you're, I, mean, I think the latter, the later one about. There's uh, one called Six Tips for Making It Small in Hollywood. Yes, that, that was in I the Times. Yeah, I think, yeah. this, is, I think this, is, this is from Six Tips to Getting Your Solo Played in Broadway. Oh, which, okay. Uh, a more recent one, I think of 2018. But anyway, I should probably read that. <laughs> but it includes, but it includes, but it includes this thing where you say revealing yourself can be lonesome when an audience doesn't respond. It feels like they're saying, not only do we not like your show, but we don't like you as a person. Yeah. And sometimes they are saying that, so don't hang out with those people, which is I, funny. Um, and then you say sometimes those people in your family you have to hang out with them. Take some steps to, to deal with that. And then you say the point is you're taking a risk for a reason. You're doing it for the people who might feel better about something in their lives because of something you're willing to admit about yours. That's like a. A relatively that's uh, really smart it's it's well it's both smart but it's also core of what you're trying to achieve i would imagine if i talked to most comics uh that that that's not you know that the that, that it seems like that's boils down to an essence of thing that many people in the business would not necessarily say that they're that they're or am i wrong about that yeah i mean look in 2000 and i you look in like the answer is maybe i mean or partly right because yeah, you, you well, can't I mean, I, it's hard to, it's hard to yeah to parse, you know, uh, 
I enjoy performing in front of audiences. Yes, I sure. enjoy laughter. Sure. I enjoy yeah. good food. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, uh, but also, but also, I feel like, like, like in two thousand and seven. I was de I developed a sitcom for CBS. It was like a multicam, yeah. sort of bastardized commercial, glossy three, you know, multicam version of my life yes. as a sitcom, and it was so eye-opening because it was it it didn't get we filmed it and it had great cast. Francis Conroy and and uh, played my mom. Bob Odenkirk played my brother. I mean, just like Nick Kroll played my cousin. It was a like, great cast, and it was good for that format mm -hmm. and then i w and but we were we were answering notes from the network and the studio and all these places and it just increasingly at every turn got watered down and that was a, a an inflection point for me in terms of like this is what i'm gonna spend my life doing i'm gonna fucking put out mediocre entertainment and like spend 90 hours a week working on that yeah why well, Why would I do that? Again, and so no, then I, I left that. Yes. And I, every, every time television calls, I say no, because I just don't want any part of that. Right. I guess all I'd say is, like, <laughs> obviously, this is, speaks to like art and artists, right? But I think for most people, even people, or people, yeah, people who are you know, very smart and very accomplished, there's like a hierarchy of things that they would never do. Like many of them are afraid to speak in public. To speak in public, people are more yeah, terrifying. Actually. So then the next thing is, there are people I know who don't like stand-up comedy because they're so because they're so they find it all so embarrassing. Yeah, they're, like, yeah. they're mortified by the prospect of standing up and trying to tell jokes in front of people. That would be even worse than public speaking. So as you go from I don't like public speaking to I would never want to tell jokes in front of people to I would never want to build an entire career around telling things that make you telling jokes and f telling funny stories around some of the most embarrassing and self revelatory things that you could ever tell about yourself or things yeah. that are expose you in a very in a very raw very vulnerable way i think for many people that's like a, like it'll be a face worse a fate worse than death <laughs> and yet you've embraced it and found a way to kind of build shows that are incredibly funny that people love it's not it's not my impression of the way that a lot of people in this business think about what they're trying to do which is mostly trying to make people laugh that's about it i don't understand the point of the other version right but I'm not wrong, right? It's the case that many comics, to your point earlier, if people laugh, if they tell jokes that kill, they're happy. That's yeah, like, but that's it. But they're our people. Well, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I, that's I mean, kind of my point. That's kind of my point, is that they're not your people. But, the whole interview here is that they're not. Yeah, like, yeah. You guys think about this in a different way. That's sort of what I'm trying to get yeah, at. But I, but I actually think that a lot of the people, like, like Mitch Hedberg, for example, when he was alive, like, I don't think he would have ex described his goals as being what, what what I describe my goals as being. Right. But the result is the same, I think. I think you watch Mitch and you do feel less alone. I think you feel like, like oh, that like rock and roll, like sunglasses guy who's looking at the floor, uh, rattling off these punchlines, thinks the same thing I do. You know, like when I saw, like if you, if you zoom out to like a, a like a comedian like a Seinfeld or, 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 or a Mitch Hedberg, where it's punchlines, you, you do experience a mini catharsis from the banality of them observing a thing that you thought only you noticed, right? right. So I'm just, I'm just doing it with personal stories. Yeah. <clears throat> it's the same thing, and those people might describe their goals differently, but it's the same thing. So here's, I'm gonna read these lists, okay, just for the sake of it so everybody understands. I ask these guys, to, can we give us five? Five uh, things, and and and, and uh, Mike's adds Mitch Hedberg, uh, Tig Notaro, who's what I want to play in a second. Kathleen Madigan, Stephen Wright, and Jared Carmichael. Jared Carmichael's got a new thing out that everybody loves. Jared right Carmichael, now. yeah, it's yeah, called Jared. North Daniels. Yeah, Wonderful, it's supposed to be incredible, right? So there's that. There's, there's a and there's a common thread through those. It's kind of interesting, like the way that they hang together for you. Um, and and this one over here oh, God. gave us a different kind of list because it's got things on it like uh, uh, let me see here. Where, 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 where are the things in this document? Do you remember who you put, who you listed? You can say I it. listed Gary Shamling, Steve Martin, yeah, mm. David Foster Wallace, yes, Nora Ephron, yes. Mm. Did I say Shamling already? Yeah, say Shamling? Chris Morris, Chris Morris, and um, uh, did I put Stephen Fry down? Yeah, you have Chris Morris, Gary Shamling, Nora Ephron, George Saunders. Oh, George Steve Martin mm. and David Foster Wallace. He had to give us six since we asked for five because mm. that's not very bad. Let him anything to do. Because right, yeah. he, mm. he put Foster, David Foster Wallace on there, who's kind of like one of these things is not like the other. You know? Well, you know, the thing is, like, I, I, I have I have written about my comedy heroes. Like, Steve Martin, I've yeah. written about Mel Brooks, Billy Crystal. Billy yeah. Crystal is the first solo show I ever saw in, like, Seinfeld. But I, I, 
You know, Steve Martin did something that's so different. Like all these people did something that's different than what people expect, and I don't think they un they they are understood as great or perfect comedy voices. Like Dave Foster Wallace had this capacity for this. Like if you ever read a supposedly fun thing, I'll never do again. It's hysterical. Oh, it's a riot. And like that that um, Twelve Monkeys piece, the piece about <coughs> John McCain Straight Talk Express, like it is laugh a sentence. I, I, I'm, I'm aware he's very funny, yeah. but I just there's not quite in the same you know but in the same I'm category. Sorry. I'm not. I love that you decided to bend but, the the category. But the bit. reason that I like I love those and Nora Ephron too. Like she wrote a thing about porn, and it's not even like that you laugh all the time. It's that you realize that. Sometimes you see the perfect line of a poem. I read a poem by this guy Matt Zapperter. I don't know if he's. I don't think he's famous, but he, there's a line about how Diet Coke tastes like uh, someone misremembering what chocolate is. And like, That's in the whole funny. poet, it's really funny. Like and like, it's not a laugh out loud, but there's something <laughs> about that. You go, yes, that's it. That's it. And Dave Foster Wallace, every sentence is, that's it. And like, Efron had that too uh, about her. And there are other like fiction writers who like Nathan England or every, like, I just love it. That's it. Thing. So is your so. list, is your list mostly people who have influenced you or people who admire, who you admire? People who have, who have, who have raised my standard, right? Like Steve Martin, everyone knows that he's a genius comedian, but how many people know that once he became famous, he invested yeah. in his own erudition to make himself into like a fine wine instead of grape juice. Like that is a thing that is like, really, but yeah, like yeah, yeah. he wrote Picasso with Lapino sure. Gilli sure. and he does what he wants and he's still a genius comedian. He just put out a comedy special with Martin Short, but like, so these are people who's, who influenced, who influenced me when I started like trying to mature to the next level. But like there are hundred, I have like dozens of, in, of in, you know. Sure, sure. Well, we had to get that manageable list here just to talk about yeah, them. Yeah, sorry. But but you, you was your list of people? Do you think of those mainly as people who have been influential or people who you admire or both? I think mostly it was an I and I admire. Right. I because I all of my I think influences of what I do now didn't really fit the category of what you asked for. Right. So like, <clears throat> so like I yeah. like James L. Brooks would be like probably my main influence sure. like when i see broadcast news i think yeah i want my shows to be like that yes. which is to say very specific characters who have very funny things about them and very dramatic things about them and there's a problem and then the uh, in the course of of airing that problem dramatically we're laughing we're laughing we're crying yeah um and also if you love broadcast news you I say I do, and I come every day and say a lot of alliteration from anxious anchors place in powerful posts every day. It's kind of an incantation to get through the day. It's one of those things I can't ever. Wait, which line? A lot of alliteration from anxious anchors place. Oh in yes, yes, yeah, yes, yes, yes. That's like, I, that's like there, I can basically do broadcast news almost. I, I can do the entire yes. thing as a as a monologue and break oh, it almost off the top of my head if I had to. I, a lot of alliteration from anxious anchors place in powerful <laughs> posts. I mean, I could do it. You know, I love that I scene could, where he's like, he will lower. You're dating. He might be the devil, yes, and he's yes, like, you can lower. He'll lower our standards bit by little I, bit. Yes, that's right. It's a beautiful All the place. places that it counts. Yes. Wow. Well, I'm, I'm semi-serious here, yeah. Jane. Yes. Right. Yeah. What is it? And, and, and uh, what is, how does it, it feel to be right like, about everything all the time? Yeah. It's awful. awful. Yeah. It's awful. Yeah. And it's a devastating line. So I want to just talk about Signatura for a second just because I think it's so, it's like, it, it speaks to something that we were just talking about a second ago. And I want to get morose about this. But I remember reading the story when she did her cancer thing. Yes, um, at Largo, yeah. At, at Largo. And so this is a famous <laughs> idea. You, I, you could tell the story if you want. She was a kind of one kind of comic before uh, before this and this kind of yes. moment was a transformative moment for yes. her career right she was I, I actually i look at this new yorker piece about it which i thought was funny in the context of what we were talking about where this person uh, the writer for this piece who uh, someone named andrew morantz back in 2012 when this happened wrote was, was telling a story of this before august 3rd of this year her stage persona takes that is it was somewhere on the Stephen Wright, Todd Berry, Mitch Hedberg continuum. Mm, right. yeah. Verbally sharp, intense but spacey, relishing awkward pauses. Some of her jokes were deadpan one-liners. You know, some were conceptually adroit. He praises her, right? And then he's like, then she showed up at Largo and did a, and did this thing. Yes. And that people who saw it in real time were like, like blown away yeah. by the genius of it. Like, you know, I think Louis C.K. was one of the people who was blown away by it. And then it, it came out. That recording of that night yes. eventually became available. So I just want to play the first. Because it's the beginning of it is the thing that really hits you the hardest is the first minute of it here, and then you kind of talk about you know why why this is genius or why she's like a comics comic I would say and a lot of yeah comics, but she's also very popular. I, I, mean, like, I, I was in Portland with her recently and we're, she was at the, the the theater next door yeah which is twice as large 
I, I did not mean to. I did not. I did not mean to suggest she was not popular. I meant to say that she has. A, she gets a lot of kind of admiration from comics. Yes. In the way she's beloved. In, and in the way that certain yes. other uh, comics are like, they're comics, comics, and people she's like an, she is take amazing. her apart in a way. So let's yeah. just play this. Uh, Hello, I have cancer. Hello. Good evening. Hello. I have cancer. How are you? Hi, how are you? Is everybody having a good time? I have cancer. How are you? Ah, uh, it's a good time. Diagnosed with cancer. Uh, feels good. Just diagnosed with cancer. Oh, God. Oh, my God. It's weird because with humor, the equation is tragedy plus time equals comedy. I am just at tragedy right now. So this goes on for a while. She hmm. talks about her, her cancer diagnosis. And Good evening, and I have cancer. <clears throat> So, yes. you know, I remember reading, you know, when, uh, when Norm Macdonald died, there were co comics who were like, would put him on a pedestal, right? And I liked reading some of these stories that tried to deconstruct why. What was it about his work that made him a particular favorite of comics? And I just said, asserted about her that that's the case. That, that piece of, of, of work right there, that people say is genius, right? I'm, I'm interested in why you guys think it's genius, if you do. Just to understand the way you think about it as a, as a, as a piece of craft. So the, it, the, a lot of these acts that we admire, they're high wire acts. Right. Like yes. Tignataro, that's a high wire act. Yeah, it's a high wire act. Yeah. I agree. I mean, I think the thing that that um, there's so much cultural discussion of comedy yeah. in the for whatever reason in the last 20 years, and you could theorize all the reasons why. And I think the thing that's often lost on people is that uh, comedians are riding the line of what's unacceptable to say in polite company and what's not unacceptable to say. Yeah. And so then when people say the thing that's unacceptable, a group of people who are kind of annoying wag their finger and they go, you cross the line. And the comedian's kind of like, yeah, no shit. I'm trying to figure out what the line is. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and it's like, and that's true of like almost all comedians. If, it's a really weird thing to, it's like walking in, to a painter's studio when they're like halfway through a painting being like, no blue, huh? Yeah. You know? <laughs> I will say also though, another broadcast news line, when she says in the movie, you cross the line, he says, well, they keep moving the little sucker, don't yeah. they? Yeah, yeah, She's like exactly the thing. It's like, you're not trying to find out where that line is and, it, but, and they do keep moving it. But also there's growth as a person too. Like I did a joke that no one ever dinged me for yeah. um, about you should, you should do it now so we can maybe cancel, no, we can maybe can, we I can maybe cancel you. I want to be canceled as a joke about someone's weight, a character within the joke. And then I read a book by this guy, Tommy Tomlinson, called The Elephant in the Room, and Tommy weighs 450 pounds oh, or yeah. something. And, I know that book. And it's a great book. And I just read it, and halfway through the first page, I was like, I'm never doing that joke again. Right. And like, mm. I don't know that, like, by the way, I'm lucky that I was exposed to that in that, in that moment, or like, but like, and I don't know that our cultural conversation has progressed to the extent that jokes about people's weight are totally verboten, yeah. but still like, it is one of the concrete examples in my life of like personal growth that is reflected in material, but, but yeah. I mean, I, I also wanna, I'll, I'll recommend something that I, that I did, <laughs> which is a, a special in 2017 called Thank God for Jokes. Yeah. Because I feel like when it came out, yeah. no one, sort of notice that it was the thing that we're going to be talking, talking about, about now, now. Yeah. Like all the time. Yeah. And so people ask me about the nature of jokes, what's crossing the line, blah, blah, blah. I, wrote, I have a whole special about it. It's is, on Netflix. Is, is, that, is <laughs> that what you think? That, that is what you think that's what that, that when you say what we're talking about all the time now is like, what was what? The nature of what is too far in what's a joke. Far, right. And whether, whether, you, where, whether a comedian can say anything. Yes. And of course, <laughs> the answer is yes. <laughs> And, and then have the consequences of what that is. Right. Because your job that yes. you chose was to cross the line. Right, and, so piss, and, like, and, and piss a bunch and of people some off. Some people are like, fuck you, we're going to fire you. You're like, all right, 
well, I guess that happened. Yeah. I guess I got to find a new job. And as you say, and thank God for jokes, everyone is offended yeah, by something. Everyone's offended by something. And yes. so some people disagree with me on that. I, I think it's true. Someone walked out of my show a couple weeks ago because they didn't like an, a joke in there that was anti, anti-vaxxers. Right? Yeah, They said it was yeah, with you until you started talking about it. Like it's... So do you think, I mean, do you think that there's, I mean, when you hear, again, we won't name names here, right? But there are, there are, uh, there are people in the, who are either working comedians or people who have other jobs, but who used to be comedians, whatever. There are like various people who like, I'm kind of made a, uh, who, the crusade against what, what they call cancel culture into a regular feature of the work they do, right? That's like a thing that, 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 that they complain about being canceled. I guess the question is like whether you think there's, I mean, what your view is of that. Like, oh, like comedians not, who I mean, there's what yes, want to talk about that yes, all the time. Yeah, I just well, I, my frustration with it so is that so I did a special about it five years ago, yeah, yeah. and I'm kind of like, um, it's in the special. Yeah, and yeah. I'm kind of like it's like people. Need, I think people maybe need a a better. Uh, I don't know. People need a, like a more thought through take. It, it it it's become a crossfire discussion. Yeah, right, right. And it, it seems, needs it, seems a, like, it needs like a thoughtful discussion. Yeah. I feel like some, like it's it's confusing because mo- a majority of the people we won't name names. Majority of the people who are going cancel culture, we can't say anything anymore. They're not that funny. Yeah. Sorry, guys. Or or you know, or, or, funny. or or you look at them and go, wait, you have a giant contract and you're still working, and there's yeah. millions of people who love you. And, and yeah. How have you been canceled? And, a lot of well, the, a lot of <clears> those people, their currency is saying. Right. Yeah, I would joke and thank God for jokes. I go like, like the people who think they're funny are like the guy at work who's like, "Nice tits, Betsy," and everyone's like, "What?" And he's like, "I'm joking." <laughs> and then I say like, "A joke should never end with I'm joking." Yeah. yeah. Right. Like most of the people who complain about it, I'm not funny. I'm just, I have to say through my teeth because they're my peers yeah. and they're like my coworkers, but they're not that funny. Mm-hmm. And then like, but there are a, a, there's a, there's a group of I would say like very very smart <laughs> comedians. Yeah who do take that up and make very valid points. So you're talking about this, I'm gonna play this, this because I'll, I, had a, I was gonna play it for a different reason, but let's play this little clip of, uh, of Mike's from Thank God for Jokes uh, and talk about what you're about to do next because we've raised it a couple times, but I wanna get, <laughs> get into it a little bit more because I saw it, at least one version of it um, uh, not that long ago. I wanna hear you talk about it a little more. So let's play that uh, number 14, please. I was at my urologist recently. <laughs> He goes, you're a comedian? I go, you're a doctor? But I didn't say it, I just thought it. <laughs> you know. And he goes, if you're a comedian, how come you're not funny now? What I wanted to say was, I'm gonna take this conversation we're having and then repeat that to strangers. <laughs> and then that's the joke. You're the joke later. Now, the reason I wanted to play that was because of the urologist reference, right? And you yeah, already, yeah. You already mentioned, you know, the... the <clears throat> urology, cancer, yeah. Cancer, which is at the center of the, of the thing you have now been working on for how long? Uh, the Old Man in the Pool you, has been in started, progress. So, so the new one was on Broadway in 18, and so I started it in 19. And what are we in now? 22? 22. So it's three years, and then it's going to be... Steppenwolf in May, Mark Taper Forum in Los Angeles in August, and then hopefully, not going to learn, off Broadway or on Broadway in 23. So it'll be like a four year process. Right. Three years into four. And I think when I saw it, what I saw it. You saw a ago, version of it, yeah. A version of it, yeah. you know, a couple months ago. I, I asked you afterwards, how many times have you done it at this point? And you were like, in some versions, some not necessarily, sometimes the entire thing, sometimes in parts, sometimes at a comedy club, sometimes here, yeah. there. Maybe you know, five, 600 times. Yeah, sure. Right. So, Again, I, I, I say, as you know, you, you have made the point in many places that you know that every piece of writing you do draft multiple drafts, you do a lot of revision. Uh, but that is like a, you know, it's not that's not fifteen drafts, that's not yeah. thirty drafts. It's that's, masochistic. It's five or six hundred <laughs> versions, and is and, and I want you to talk about about your process because it was like you're like I come, I finish, I t- I tape every. Every time I do it, I tape it. I listen to it the next day. I go through it. Like you're so rigorous about it, and it goes on for years, yeah. for hundreds of iterations to get to the final thing that we're going to see on Broadway. Knock wood. Yeah. Just talk about that. My my view on on these specials is I view them like little films or little plays. Yeah. Which is to say that um, I want people to be able to watch them in ten years from now. I want people to be able to watch them in twenty years from now. 
I don't know if that'll happen. That's the goal. Right. Um, that that's how long it takes to certainly it takes to make a film uh, or a play, if not longer. You know, I know Bombeck made one of my favorite films, *The Squid and the Whale*. He was in process for nine years or something like that. Right. I mean, it was like a wild, wild ride. And so my sense is, especially now when we're inundated with content. We're inundated with people's TikTok videos and, and Instagram posts and all these things, and, and everything is a TV series. Every half idea. I mean, like, I'm sort of amazed when you see a documentary and you're like, that was a good documentary. And then they make a narrative TV series of the fucking documentary? Like, no, I Which saw is based on the. the yeah, 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 I saw the documentary. I'm good. Yeah. And, like, I, I, so my sense is, like, my contract with my audience is if you come see me live, or you watch my specials or my movies, it will be all I have to offer. Sure. And 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 it not going to be half-assed. I'm right. going to give it everything. But I, so that's that's an answer to a question that was like, "Ma'am, you put a lot of time into this documentary <laughs> process." That's not really about talk about what kind of. I mean, it's one thing I'm trying to address. But what I find interesting about it is the, I mean, there are books, articles, speeches, things that are written that go through multiple drafts and revisions. Many of them, right? Um, Probably most of them we could use more. Yes. But five or six hundred is not a normal number. And you can say it takes place over X number of years. Yeah. I'm, I'm not, I'm, There's I'm no way to workshop this other than in front of an audience. Well, you can't do it in a carriage house in front of a mirror. That's, I'm, again, I'm obviously not being critical. I'm just yeah. raising the point of like the kind of discipline it takes to go do it every night. And then, again, to your point, like you were saying, I, I perform it, then I listen to it, then I take notes on it, yeah. then I take one thing out the next night. There's just a kind of rigor to that that I think is unusual by, by the standards of most. I mean, there are movies that take seven or eight years in process, but it's not like the person's like shooting the movie for seven years or in, the, or in, the, in post production for seven years, taking two seconds out of the thing for seven years. That's, not, that's an unusual degree of rigor. I would say. So, so I think like when I started out in comedy, I think my goals, when we were talking about this earlier, was like, was like what are you trying to do? What are your goals? And it's like, when I started out in my 20s, it was so superficial. Yeah. And I'm like so embarrassed of what yeah. my goals were because it was like, be famous. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah. be popular. Uh, get laughs, be popular. Yeah. And at a certain point in doing that, I had some degree of success where I could actually experience like, oh, that's not gonna do it. Yeah. That's not enough. Yeah. That doesn't satiate. That doesn't satiate me. Uh, and it, I don't think it, it's giving the audience enough. And so my sense is like, yeah, that's my process. My process. I put it in front of a lot of people. The full version, uh, I've probably put in front of people like a hundred and fifty times. Yeah. And I would say. Like the, these comedy seller sets where I workshop like 10 or 10 to 20 minute pieces, yeah, that's probably hundreds, 500, 600 times. Yeah. But, but so that, far, so far. But also, and then I'm doing 20 at Steppenwolf in Chicago and 40 in Los Angeles. And then if I do it on or off Broadway, probably like the last show I did 100 performances. <laughs> and you'll still be changing it. And I still make tweaks. Right. And, and, and before you say what you're going to say, what, the old man in the pool, again, give, what's your log line for, for the old man in the pool? The Old Man in the Pool is about this moment in my life where I, I, I go, I'm, I'm 43 now, and a few years ago I go to my doctor and he asked me to do the pulmonary test, yeah. and I blow into the thing and I, and I fail it. And he sends me a cardiologist and he goes, you have a history of heart disease. I'm like, oh, well, dad had a heart attack at 56. His dad had a heart attack at 56. And I was like, all these bells are going off in my head and I'm going like, oh, you know, this is going to end. Yeah. And it's sort of, how do I feel about this? Yeah. And, and, and what's funny about that? Yeah. And how can we savor this moment now and then it takes an unexpected turn? Yeah. So it's basically the log line is, this is about, it's like, uh, Mike Rubig, it could be a rap. It could be a rap. Could be a rap. Could be a rap about Mike Rubig and how I dealt with it. Could be a rap on Rubig, yeah. Could, yes. And it's, and, how it's, and it's always possibly a rap on everybody all the time. Yeah. It's, I will say, it, it, sounds, it doesn't sound as funny as it is. It's, it's very funny. funny. It's very funny. It's very funny. It's very funny. But you know, when you hear it, it's like, well, it's about, it's about me coming face to face with my mortality. It's yeah. like, well, laugh riot. There. It's got 100 um, But it turns out jokes. to be very funny. Yeah. Um, you've seen it how many times? In how many versions? Five. 
Yeah. Um, in bits and pieces. Yeah. I saw it from the index card in a field <laughs> in Connecticut to <laughs> outdoor shows during the pandemic. What was what was what caught me off guard is, you know, every she's still tweaking, but every show's worth the price of the ticket hmm. tenfold. Yeah. And so it's like one of those things where I was like, Jesus Christ. Yeah. Like, by the way, it's hard, a little hard for me because I am also comparing, and my dad will sometimes tell me not to do this, <laughs> but he'll be like, I'm like, fuck. If, if uh, my stuff is very, you know, comparatively ramshackle, but like, <laughs> no, no, no. it's, but you know, like, comparatively it, ramshackle. in terms of like, it's you know, phrase. it's a good turn of phrase. <laughs> like one of us is like, uh, you know, you can't, I understand that if you're like a recumbent otter, you can't measure yourself against a cheetah, but like it really is like, it is, uh, my process is, is, I've only done things a certain way. And also like, I was sort of finding my, I wasn't tactile or clear sighted enough to, uh, to find good instruction and good practices early on in my solo show life because I got, Good. It was the first thing I'd ever, like I won an award in Edinburgh that started my career in 2014 mm. for a show called Millennial, which is about the sort of millennial cohort that I found myself in. It was before the word got annoying. Yeah. And, um, and so I, because of that reception, I was using some pretty sloppy habits. <laughs> and because I was, you know, everyone's like, ah, oh, that's pretty good. I was like, well, I guess I'm just gonna keep doing those sloppy habits. And now, sometimes when I watch a really good person in a really good process, I'm like, it could have been a good show, or it could have been better. You know, it could have been like I get, I get, empirically that you can't like that you have to grow and that you can't just be the thing immediately. But like, it's it's really good uh, the show. But he makes big changes. Like that's what surprises me. Well, like between between show one and show five, the show is both very much the the same and completely different. And like. It's a really like the ending will change. The, yeah, the, I, in, of, in part well, of the in part of the answer too, though, like why all the drafts? Like when I started out in my twenties, my dad was a you know my dad was a neurologist, my mom was a nurse, and so like they sent me to Georgetown. It's like they didn't yeah. send me to Georgetown to become a comedian. Yeah. So I had this inherent sense of like <laughs> this is I am failing all the time. Every day I'm doing this, yeah. and every day that I'm not wildly successful, I'm failing. And so I really had this sense of like, well, if I'm gonna do this, I have to treat it like a job. And and so I, when I first moved to New York, I didn't even have the money to do this really. I, I rented an office. When I was like 22 years old, I like rented an office and, and, and went there every day and did the nine to five and then I did shows at night, of nine to five of myself, yeah, of my yeah, own sure. work and whatever. So like part of I think part of it's that it's like this work ethic of like of like well I'm not I don't know I'm not like I'm not, I'm, I'm a comedian but I'm also like I have I, this is serious this yes. is a serious job yeah well um, I I can't let pass the notion that like I I believe I I mean if I were to add up all the interviews I've ever done in my life hundreds of thousands of hours, hundreds of thousands, and I've never heard anybody compare themselves to a recumbent otter before. Ah. Like I was like, that's, like, like, that's actually that will be what I remember from this interview. Yeah, 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 yeah. She's like, yeah, I'm a recumbent otter. I can't compare myself to a cheetah. I'm like, but no, you can't. Mm. Um, but you also mm. probably shouldn't have started with a recumbent otter. I just, um, so funny. <laughs> I mean, that's like, <laughs> that's like just a, 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 an image I'm not going to forget, uh, not long forget. I want to play two more things, and then we'll be done. We don't have to say much about them. I just want to actually get them in because I, I want to ask you one question about this. You just mentioned the millennial thing. So mm -hmm. let's play that, uh, Alex Edelman. Uh, this, you don't have is, a clip from Millennial. Those clips don't exist. Well, this is a, you talking about Millennial oh, in, in wow. 2019 oh, I love this on, on Comedy Central. So, you know, it's, I, you, you, you use the word Millennial. You talk yeah. about Millennial. So we're going to play the Millennials. And if it's not the right thing. No, no, go. Please go. How is any millennial ever gonna own a home? How is any young person ever gonna own a home? It's maybe hate old people. I see a few of you in here tonight. I hate you. Because every old person in a city like LA or New York or London is the same. They're like, my house is worth $2 million. But when I bought it in 1981, I paid 11 raspberries for it. <laughs> And every young person's like, I have nine roommates! <laughs> we each pay $11,000 a month. Although I missed the payment last month, he took a toe, I walk in a circle now. 
I'd like you to not uh, use that pro that tone that you use with the word raspberries ever again. It's like, I very funny. funny. Uh -huh. It's a thing that got me. Oh. Yeah. Um, um, that's a bad habit that I you know now find painful to watch. Yeah. So too, so I, here's the thing. So given <laughs> given where you are now and mm -hmm. what you think of what you've. Got how far I know you will say, you know, there's still lots of work to do and still lots of improvement, even on the show you're currently making. But when you look at that, do you think, man, I was like, is that do you look at that and say, I see that as part of a natural evolution and I'm, you know, you, I'm growing, or do you look at that and kind of cringe? But I only ask because you just said the thing about cringe. Both, but by the way, I find it funny, but you know, no, 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 no it's funny, but it, it's, uh, and also that joke, I love, there are certain jokes that I've done over the course of my life that have had resonance with people, even yeah. though the jokes are imperfect, that I really love. I hear from, people about that joke hey, sure. almost every day. Sure. Yes. Like seriously, people write me about yeah. that joke, they go, hey, they want to tell me where they live and how much they pay. Like yeah. I have weirdly, uh, I have weirdly like, it's yeah. like, I live in Denver, I pay $2,100 for a one bedroom. <laughs> I'm like, okay, you're paying too much, I can find you a different one right now. But like, uh, the thing is, uh, I did that show, it was, it was a 10 p.m. taping after they had done a 7 p.m. taping and they were using the same audience. Yeah. And I was, I was ninth on the lineup. I yeah. needed to be high energy for that audience to get them where they needed to be. But I, I, I really, like the goofiness that I, uh, what happened was I was opening for bigger comedians. Yeah. So I was playing these huge venues, yeah. opening for them. Yeah. And then like, and so my mannerisms were appropriate in big theaters and, and uh, like uh, smaller arenas. And then I was doing my regular sh sets that any sort of, you know, uh, comedian yeah. would be doing. And I still had my, like stadium mannerisms, so they were grossly over exaggerated. But like, but you know, like uh, that is what that joke needed in that show. So, so yeah. That was, uh, I, I joked before about you doing the the, the new the show you're the, the, the just for us, just about us, um, just, just for us. us, just for us, Jesus. I joked before about about just for us. I, I still think it was just as the Alex Alman Jew show. Sure. Um, oh, great. <laughs> Alex Alman Super Jew show. Uh, Anytime he says I'm a Super Jew, Alex Alman guy show. I joked about you doing that for a long time into the future. But what do you actually think? I mean, if I, when I played that, I think, oh, you know, that's really funny. But it's not really what he's now doing. Do you think, like, you ever imagine going back and doing things that are more like oh, that? Oh, yeah. I Is mean, that where you want to go back to, in that direction? I, that's that's not totally more... out of my repertoire, that joke, yeah. actually. Like, yeah, yeah, I yeah. bring it back every so often and fiddle with bits on the end of it and segue it into a bit about how we need right. younger politicians because of things like yeah. this. And so, like, my comedy actually is has been fairly political. And the stuff that I'm going to do, like, I love comics that hunt big game. Right. It's so, like, my next show, the show that I've... I've started to like take notes here and there and think about it and like it might be about like Israel and Palestine like it might be about like all the powers on the third rail yeah. and so like I, I don't know what I'm going to do next honestly I, I'm still very much loving the show yeah. and changing the show and like tweaking the show as, as well and trying to so get it I'm not going to produce it yeah yeah yeah, yeah. I'll <laughs> put that on the record right now. I, I just don't have any strong opinions. <laughs> I, I don't. I'm not. I'm not here right now. Mike. Mike would like to. Mike would like to make clear that on a variety of levels that uh, I love you. All right. But I'm not with you. I'm not with you on that. All right. Sorry. So you do the one after, which is an intricate defense of Jeffrey Epstein. <laughs> I've, got, I've, got, uh, I've got. I've got. one of the one of the Netanyahu nephews who would be happy to. Uh, oh happy to I take a sip of my water. I put it down. You're both gone. No, like, <laughs> what the fuck is that? Like Jesus. Man. I thought we already established that this was not a place for. Or anyone Gosh. safely to tread. Yeah, I know. Like, I like the third rail. But, you know, like, but I do think that maybe there's could something. Be, maybe abortion. How about? But you know what? There is something that's euthanasia. threading the needle. Like, new, like you know, sometimes someone goes, "Who's career do you want?" It's a, it's a bit of a. I don't know how I feel about that question generally, but I love Stephen Fry's ability to be sort of like, I live in the gray space. And I live in a space where, like, um, it's more important to be effective than correct. And I live in a space where people should try to figure out problems instead of never talking about it because they're so they're so dangerous. And I don't have the cachet for that right now. But like, maybe I can figure out how to like thread the needle. I lived there for a while. I have opinions that made me unpopular in rooms of, of people with strong opinions on both sides. So like, maybe that's a good middle point. Yeah. They can hate me. Like, yeah. the, like there's a there is something. That is interesting to me about like yeah. those big conversations. So yes. I don't know. Well, um, I look forward to seeing that. And <laughs> yeah. You, and you, um, I, I feel like you're like in, like the perfect place. You don't really you're like you, you couldn't be in a better place than you are right now, right? Just when you do way too much stuff, you got like the perfect career. You get to make the stuff you want to make. 
you get to address the kind of issue you want to address. You get to have these acting parts and these kind of cool movies. I know, you know, you've got like, you got some work coming up with some like super cool stuff. Like, yeah, yeah. No, could I, it be any better? Like it's uh, living the dream. It's in a Tom Hanks movie. I know, yeah, that's, that's what I was referring no. to. The, isn't the same, making a movie with Tom Hanks? Yeah, no, no, yeah. The, Are you allowed to say that out loud? Yeah, Tom yeah, Hanks, no, I think, they, they, I think, they, I think they, they, I think they said, and then, you know, I feel, um, this is, uh, I'm very lucky, very fortunate. I, I, I pursued a thing yeah. and I'm able to do it and, and people show up to see me do it and I'll keep doing it until they stop showing up. Yeah. And that's a very fortunate position to be in. I mean, but it's just like, I, I just see thinking about the old man in the pool, it's like, you've kind of bought yourself the freedom to make stuff, to go out and make the thing about mortality that like, I mean, you know, you have to be have a certain kind of, have a, have, you've established right. a certain kind of commercial and artistic track record <laughs> right. to be able to go and make that. Hey, right. yeah, I'm gonna do a thing about like, about my cancer and I go, oh, I'm gonna die. And like, how do I, what have I learned from my brush with mortality? It's right. like, that's a, I've heard, know, I've heard that. I don't know if you and I were talking about this. Paul Thomas Anderson, he's like, he made Boogie Nights. And then, and then um, because of that, he got to make Magnolia, you know? Which is like the movie that like, how do you pitch that exactly? Uh, uh, that's right. You know what I mean? <laughs> but it's so good. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and yeah, I feel like, yeah, I feel very lucky. The, the, the shows have done well. And so, yeah, I'm able to make this show that I'm very passionate about. And I mean, I'd like to think that this show, The Old Man in the Pool, is actually the most universal of any of my shows. So like my last show was the new one and I had this inflection point. I posted about this on Instagram the other day because I performed at Princeton the other night, The Old Man of the Pool, and I performed the new one in Princeton in 2017 before it came to Broadway. Yeah. And in that show, it's all about my decision and my wife's decision to have a child. Yeah. I never wanted to have a child. And it's about the 180 of like, and I had a child and I was right. And then also I was wrong. And that's the emotional part about it. And when I performed it at Princeton in 2017 at McCarter, I could see that when I talked about having children that there was like a glaze in their yeah. eyes. It's like they couldn't yeah. find like a way in. Children. Yeah. yeah couldn't find a way in and I was like no, no no I need there to be a way in and so I created if you watch the new one on Netflix there's a there's a metaphor that's the first four minutes of the show about having a couch yeah. and <laughs> you know you you know and and someday you know you you bring a couch in from the street and you're like I love this couch it's a metaphor for just like comfort and existence and domesticity and, and that's how I start the show. And I start it that way because I put it in front of college kids and they didn't get the kid thing. But they understood a couch. And, and the show arrives at a couch, at the couch metaphor. With this show, it's so fundamentally about being alive that I actually think, it, who knows, but may, it might have the widest reach of my shows because it's just about being alive and that we could all go at any second. And it's got, you know, 175 jokes, and, and it, it's a great night out. <laughs> it's a great you know night. I mean? it, it is a, and you, and are you still ending in the way? Remember the, when I saw you, you had just started to end in a new way. Yeah, that's it's still there. With an, a way of yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm not gonna. I won't. I'm not gonna. Yeah, don't give away the ending, but I yeah, won't. it's a fun. But it was. Uh, it's a. It's. It was. It's. But it's powerful, not just fun. Oh, and thanks. And uh, I remember that night. Uh, you were again in this note, that mode of like, do you think that worked? And I was like, it, you could feel the, the audience. You, know, you can feel a, a physical reaction to it in the in the yeah in love, the, I love that and that people love leaning, the physical people, reaction people, people, people leaning forward in their seats and kind of like having that like charge of electricity with the end of it I, again I will not I will not spoil it but um, I remember I had no idea there was any other ending ever previously and you sat down you're like oh we only started doing this like five days ago yeah yeah and we changed yeah. the ending of the show I'm like oh my god I'm like you know, yeah that's the most, I, that's I say the most when, uh, when when the old man in the swimming pool. Old, old man, man in the pool. The old man in the pool. When the old man in the pool opens. Wait till Hemingway comes after me. You just gotta. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you gotta go see it. Um, you guys are great. Thank you for. Uh, Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks.